Hey squad, it's your squid here at Anxious Squid Productions. These guys are the supporters of my channel, I like money, and they give me some of these on a monthly basis. You could do that too if you wanted to, there are various links in the description that lead to various ways. You can buy stuff from uh, affiliates, or you can just pay me like they do, the top of the list there on Patreon. Uh, there are also links to the various parts of the internet that I traversed through to find the details of this story, the, the bits that I wasn't 100% on. But let's, let's dive straight into the history today though, shall we? Today's video is about a grouping of Jawa Jali, Gantjamara, and Watjabalak men, Australian Aboriginal men from various parts of what is now known as Western Victoria. About here. Okay, so uh, today's video is about the very first team to represent Australia as a nation, on a national scale, that is, in any sport. The Victorian Aboriginal cricket team that toured England in the year 1868. Today's video is about how 33 years prior to the Australian Federation, 33 years prior to Australia becoming a nation, that is, an all-Aboriginal Australian men's cricket team toured England and outperformed all expectations. Oh, and their coach? Their coach was the bloke that had invented the sport of AFL. I think it's a super interesting tale, and uh, it's one I couldn't find much about on YouTube, if I'm honest, and... Quite frankly, I wanted to fix that, so here we are. I'll do my best to do the story justice, uh, but we'll get into it now. We'll get past the jingle and, yeah, let's get into it. In the Western District of the State of Victoria, this state here, from the early 1860s and onwards, the cricket matches took place on cattle stations between European settlers and Aboriginal people who worked as stockmen during the downtime for all involved. For context, many Aboriginal people were employed as stockmen by local station owners at the time, uh, and it's thought that's where they had initially learnt about cricket and its rules, as well as where they taught Europeans about the sport of Marn Grook. Man Grook is a game fairly similar to what we now know as AFL, and it was, and is still in some parts of Australia, played with a possum skin, oval shaped ball, uh, and it was obviously played by Aboriginal people. There are no boundaries or offsides or standard field sizes even in Man Grook, and as a result, broadly speaking, the Aboriginal people who played both sports were admired for their superior athletic skills when compared to the Europeans, who realistically only played cricket. Uh, sort of like how here in North America, lacrosse is seen as an adaption of a First Nations sport, uh, the same can be said for AFL in Australia. I'll do a video on Marne Grook comparing the differences and similarities to the AFL in the future at some point if you want. Let me know in the comments if that sounds interesting. Uh, starting this particular story off at the beginning though, in early 1866, a series of cricket matches were staged on cattle stations with the specific intention of selecting the strongest possible Aboriginal original 11 to play against a representative side, made up of former Europeans who lived in the Victorian area as well. An 11 is just another way to refer to a cricket team, by the way, for, for my non-Australian friends watching this as well. The resulting team of Jawa Jali, Gunjamara and Wachabalak men were initially coached by a local pastoralist named William Heyman against the Victorian Europeans in those early matches. However, in preparation for a tour of New South Wales, playing teams from the area of that colony for money and for sheep stations, Heyman would end up embezzling sponsorship funds and leaving the team high and dry up in a state where they weren't familiar with any of their surroundings. Seems like a nice bloke, doesn't he, right? Incidentally, that's where the saying, we're not playing for sheep stations, comes from in Australia. Uh, when, you, when you're playing a friendly match or an exhibition match or like, park cricket, local club cricket, whatever. We're not playing for sheep stations uh, is a term used when someone is taking it too seriously or, or being a bit of a knob, you know? Back in the day, uh, people would actually put their land and farming infrastructure up in place of money as a way of betting on sports. And it would make, a thing, it would make things a lot less friendly than a game of hit around with no consequences, right? But anyway, when Heyman deserted the men in New South Wales, up here, about a 24 hour drive away, uh, before cars were invented though, so that was a bad way of describing it. Anyway, when he deserted them, coaching duties were subsequently turned over to a bloke named Tom Wills on basically a dime, right? Tom was the captain of the Victorian cricket team at the time anyhow, and uh, he also just happened to be in New South Wales 
and in the exact same town as the Aboriginal men in the side anyway. Uh, some some people talk about this as, as being fate, but I personally don't believe in fate, so we'll skip past that sidetrack that we could have gone down, but I'm sure you'll go down it yourself if you want, give it a Google, all that sort of jazz, but yeah. Incidentally, around 10 years prior to the tour of England with this team, Tom Wills was the founder of the sport now known as Australian Rules Football. What is known as AFL these days, right, in the big leagues. You can rest assured that we absolutely will discuss Tom Wills at great length in another video for this playlist at some point in the future as well. Uh, when I promise things like that, it could be two weeks from now, could be two years from now. So just hit the subscribe button and the bell to get notified when that gets uploaded and... Uh, Enjoy my other content in the meantime. I won't go into too much more than surface level detail here, but upon hearing of the Aboriginal team's desertion in a local bar in New South Wales one evening, Tom Wills instantly took the mantle as their captain and coach, and he set about raising funds for a tour of England. He was a contemporary entrepreneur-ish sort of bloke at the time, right? Uh, and, I mean, inventing AFL based on the Aboriginal sport of Marnbrook uh, to keep cricketers fit in the winter initially was just one of his new and innovative ideas at the time. Uh, the, the point I'm making is that I imagine, uh, I imagine the man saw dollar signs when he heard about the team, despite, despite the humanitarian legacy people have painted for him in the years since. Uh, I suppose it is possible to do the right thing because it's the right thing and because it's profitable. Uh, I mean, all you've got to do is look at the Pride logos and Black Lives Matter logos companies have made in modern America today to see that, right? Uh, but I'll accept that maybe I'm being too cynical on that front, so we'll move over, we'll, we'll move over or we'll move on again, right? From the outset, Will spoke to the team in an Aboriginal language that he had learnt as a child growing up among the Jab Warung people who were, by a stroke of luck, a neighbouring culture to all of the men from all three sections of the cricket team. Here's a new map of Victoria that I haven't showed you yet, right? Uh, this time showing the Jab Warung where Tom grew up and the Jawajali and the Gunchamara and the Wachabalak. Sorry to my future self for making you edit so much and uh, look for all these maps that I'm only really about 70% sure actually exist. <laughs> One day you'll make enough money to pay an editor and apologise to them instead. Uh, draw your own maps if you can't find one, you lazy fuck. Anyway, also, while I'm sidetracked, talking to my future self, uh, sorry to any Aboriginal people who are offended by my bastardization of the names I try to pronounce in this video uh, and others. I tried to find proper pronunciations online and I couldn't, uh, so I'm doing my best. But feel free to correct me in the comments. I'll, I'll take it... Uh, well, you know. Anyway, while the language, languages the Aboriginal men spoke were not all exactly identical, they were all closely linked and similar enough that the men could understand one another with little effort. Uh, think about how closely the Romance languages in Europe can be related, or, or the various dialects of Swahili and such in Eastern Africa, for example, right? Uh, it's the same sort of thing. Will's decision to join and help the team was a source of intrigue to people at the time, almost as as, as much as it is to us now, right? Uh, we as modern day Australians mostly do now look back on Tom Wills with rose-coloured glasses, uh, observing Wills to be a pivotal figure in the history of reconciliation and race relations in Australia, not in small part due to this tour. Uh, Wills lodged with his players on tour as their captain coach, and he was able to mostly speak their language, as I said. He invented AFL based heavily, very heavily, around the Aboriginal game of Mangrook, and he was a vocal proponent, a vocal proponent from the very beginning of the sport that it should not be segregated. Only five years prior to becoming their captain coach, five years after the invention of AFL, Will survived a massacre in Queensland in which his father and 18 other colonial settlers were murdered by local Aboriginal people. That's just here, by the way, and this massacre would actually stand the test of time as the largest massacre of European settlers committed by Aboriginal people in Australia, all the way up until today, the date of filming this, which I've got a nice new calendar that I put there, so no matter how long you edit it, no matter how long I edit it for, you know what the date of filming was. Uh, people at the time couldn't understand how Wills could happily play sport with quote-unquote them in the wake of the massacre. 
Despite Wills publicly declaring his understanding that all Aboriginal people were not a monolith and that it made no sense to him to blame all Aboriginals for that attack, especially not the ones he'd grown up with or, or known for decades in the southern states and established British territories, right? Uh, people were still surprised that he would take on this position of leadership amongst the Aboriginal men and help them to succeed so publicly. Regular viewers of the channel will probably know what I'm about to say, because I say it in almost every video I make, right? Uh, that's the point of me making them. But I just want to mention that as an Australian historian, people like Tom Wills are really refreshing to come across, if I'm honest, right? As far as I'm concerned, Tom Wills and his actions, uh, and the actions I'm outlining for you here at the very least, uh, prove that racism was never simply the order of the day in Australia. Often, in my chosen field of interest, the experts, or the people who think they're experts, suggest you should forgive bigots from the past simply because they were in the past and they supposedly didn't know any better. People like William Dawes, who I've done a video on in this playlist, if I remember I'll put a thingy either at the end of the video or a grey thingy or whatever, uh, what contents Joseph Banks as well as Tom Wills and many other men from the same time period show us that the people at the time did in fact know better when they weren't being willfully ignorant that is. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked with moral indignation again and regular viewers will be used to that as well so <laughs> let's try to get back on task, alright? Uh, Wills and his team would manage to procure enough funding in New South Wales to return to Victoria and continue their tour of cricketing clubs l local to home in an attempt to raise even more money for their theorised tour of England, right? On Boxing Day in 1866, in front of over 10,000 spectators, Wills captained the team against the Melbourne Cricket Club at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. A publisher at the time, Bell's Life in Victoria, reported... Seldom has a match created more excitement in Melbourne than the one under notice, and never within our recollection has a match given rise to so much feeling on behalf of the spectators. The veteran Wills never captained an eleven who so thoroughly possessed the sympathies of the spectators. A Melbourne correspondent for the Sydney Mail even went so far as to write that a dark skin suddenly became a passport to the good graces of Victorians, because the men were so good at the sport they'd adopted and it seemed such a spectacle for the fans, right? Incidentally, this match falling on Boxing Day, uh, which is the day following Christmas Day for those who don't celebrate it and were wondering, uh, this, this match would be honoured in Australian cricketing history from about the 1970s onward, right? It's a tradition in Australia. There is a match on Boxing Day every year and has been for 50 odd years now, right? Uh, though I'll admit, they're not deliberately honouring this match. The Boxing Day Test match has become a staple of Australian tradition, and it was restarted, like I said, in around the 1970s. Um, actually, I'll look it up, right? It's up there. I'll be specific in the edit. Uh, I'm currently ad-libbing while I wait for the script to catch up to me. Uh, but this particular team from 1868 is, sadly, a forgotten, a forgotten piece of Australian history. When people talk about the first Boxing Day Test match, they generally refer to the Victorian and New South Welshman Stoush on Boxing Day of 1892, nearly two and a half decades after the match we're talking about in this video. Now, this could be because of a combination of poor record keeping and uh, a lack of awareness on behalf of the governing bodies of the sport and, and fans of the sport in Australia, but if that was the case, how the heck would I know about it to tell you right now, right? Um, if you ask me, and if I'm being frank for a second, hi, I'm Frank, uh, it probably has more to do with the racist opinions of those in charge during the 1970s. I imagine it would be far easier to market a collection of Victorian sheep farmers playing against New South Welshman cattle ranchers for a from a hundred years prior than to admit the first team to represent the country was entirely Aboriginal, especially considering it was only 1967, less than a decade prior, when Australia decided to count Aboriginals as people in the census and include them in the government data in the first place, right? And while we're here on the topic, incidentally, there is a myth in Australia that Aboriginals were counted as flora and fauna prior to that referendum, and, and while it is absolutely true that they were treated like cattle, generally speaking, uh, it's false to say that from a legislative perspective, Aboriginal people were thought of as animals. 
they weren't thought of at all in the legislation. Animals, and certainly stock, you know, cattle or sheep, had substantially more rights than Aboriginals. To, to suggest that Aboriginals were on the same level as sheep back then is a ridiculous overstatement. Australia is yet to reconcile themselves with this racist history, and I'll say it unequivocally now, just like I do in most videos, right? If you're an Australian who doesn't like me pointing that out, feel free to leave a dislike on your way out the metaphorical door. I genuinely don't care. I earn my money with your view regardless. You've probably already heard this next line from the conservative side of politics, but it's a good one because it's true, so I'll repeat it here in this context. Facts don't care about your feelings, mate. But anyhow, back to 1866 at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Although our lads lost narrowly to the Melbourne Cricket Club that day, the Aboriginal players were widely commended for their performance and, and, and they showed the crowds and the government and, and the sporting body of the day uh, that there was marked improvement of their cricketing abilities on subsequent tours of County Victoria in the following months. This would turn out to be the tour that was deemed financially successful enough to raise the allocated funds for the team to finally tour England. The team arrived in London on the 13th of May 1868 and were met with a degree of fascination, right? That being the period of evolutionary controversies following the publication of Charles Darwin's uh, The Origin of Species in 1859. The false theory of social Darwinism was considered fact at the time and the reaction to Aboriginal people from the native English was mixed. I'll flash the definition of social Darwinism up above me here in the edit, right? Uh, I really don't want to go down that dumb rabbit hole in yet another video. I feel like it's something we cover in most of them. Uh, pause it and read the definition if you want, if you really want, and you haven't yet. Uh, it's easily refuted by the concept of situational knowledge or situated knowledge, which I'll also flash up a definition of for you. So if you're interested in learning more, you now know the terms and the definitions to start your Google journey with, right? Uh, getting on with the video though, not everyone was impressed with the Aboriginal team being afforded the rights to travel freely back then, with the newspaper called The Times in England describing the touring Australian team at the time as a travesty upon cricketing and the conquered natives of a convict colony. The Daily Telegraph even said of Australia at the time, right, that Nothing of interest comes from there except gold nuggets and seemingly now black cricketers. The first match was played at the Oval on the 25th of May in London and attracted 20,000 spectators. Presumably, many of these spectators attended out of curiosity surrounding Aboriginal people in general, rather than merely to savour a cricket or sporting contest. Uh, but the number is still huge if you factor in the population at the time, right? The Times reported that the hair and their hair and beards are long and wiry, their skins vary in shade of blackness, and most of them have broadly expanded nostrils. Having been brought up in the bush to agricultural pursuits under European settlers, they are perfectly civilised and are quite familiar with the English language. So I guess if you were interested in the actual match or the prowess of the players that England might be having a go against, you had to read a different paper, right? The Daily Telegraph wrote, It is highly interesting and curious to see mixed in a friendly game on the most historically Saxon part of our island, representatives of two races so far removed from each other as the modern Englishman and the Aboriginal Australian. Although several of them are native bushmen, and all are as black as night, these Indian fellows are to all intents and purposes clothed and in their right minds. The Sporting Life? A publication from London at the time said they are the first native Australians to have visited this country on such a novel expedition, but it must not be inferred that they are savages. On the contrary, they are perfectly civilised, having been brought up in the bush to agricultural pursuits with respect to their prowess as cricketers, that will be conclusively determined by their first public match. So, good on the sporting life, or whatever it was that they were called earlier in my script here, for, uh, for at least talking about the cricket, I guess, right? Altogether, the Aboriginal team played 47 matches throughout England over a period of six months, winning 14 of those matches, losing 14, and drawing or tying 19 matches as well. A fantastic result that surprised many at the time, considering they were expected to lose every match. 
by a large margin. Their skills were said to range from individuals who were exceptional athletes, like Johnny Muller, I'll get to him in a second though, down to two or three other team members who hardly contributed at all. A dynamic that seems to have lasted the test of time in group projects, as anyone who has studied anything recently will tell you, right? The most outstanding player for our touring team was a bloke by the name of Johnny Muller, as I said. Uh, he scored 1,698 runs and took 245 wickets across the length of the tour. An admired English fast bowler of the time, George Tarrant, bowled to Muller during a lunch interval and later proclaimed, I have never bowled to a better batsman. They became strong friends and exchanged letters all the way up until their deaths. Upon their return to Australia, Muller was employed for a time as a professional with the Melbourne Cricket Club, and he represented Victoria against the touring English team and his friend in 1879, al alongside the White Cricketers, where he top scored in the second innings of his first match. And I do mean employed, employed there, not employed, employed, right? Actually employed. He was paid with money, not lodging or drugs or something, right? Money. Johnny Muller could easily be described as Australia's Jackie Robinson, if Australians gave a shit, right? <laughs> um, for context, the Central Board for Aborigines was a governing body specifically designed to eradicate Aboriginal cultures. And that's not an exaggeration. It's not some bleeding heart lefty's opinion. In fact, I, I don't really consider myself a bleeding heart, but that's for you to judge, right? Uh, it's, it's a documented and easily verifiable fact. The government wanted to breed them out. That was their official policy for decades. Steal the kids from their families, put them in internment camps for their entire childhood, make them marry white folk, and then within two or three generations, eradicate their culture entirely. To soothe the pillow of a dying race was their stated objective. The, uh, the history of that government wing is truly abhorrent, and regular viewers of the channel will know that because I harp on about it a fair amount. I'm going to try not to. I've got a video about astronomy coming soon. But yeah, anyway, the Central Board for Aborigines ruled in 1869 that it would be illegal to remove any Aboriginal person from the colony of Victoria without the specific written approval of the government minister. This effectively curtailed the involvement of Aboriginal players in the game, and uh, Johnny Myler was fired then never approved to tour with the team again. Come to think of it, that's probably why Muller isn't thought of in the same ilk as Jackie Robinson, now I think on it, actually. Uh, there was no Pee Wee Reese to throw his arm around him and wear the same number and whatnot uh, in front of a raucous crowd. He just got left out in the cold by his teammates at the time. Uh, but anyway... That was the story of how an Aboriginal cricket team represented Australia before Australia was even a thing, uh, and how the bloke who invented AFL was their coach and their captain and the guy that helped make it happen. I'm going to finish the video by saying uh, my personal belief. It's my personal belief that anyone who utters the phrase, keep politics out of sports today in 2021, need only hear a few more stories like this to understand that sports have always been political and they've always been at the forefront of political action uh, for a great number of people, myself included as an immigrant to this great nation of America. Life is political. Choosing not to be political is, in and of itself, a political option that some people are simply not afforded, right? I hope you enjoyed this video today, guys. These history ones are the most labour-intensive on the channel. I started writing the script over a month ago. Uh, do me a favour if you're still here listening and, and hit the like button for me. Subscribe if you haven't yet and consider throwing some money my way. Don't, don't feel like you have to. These are the folks who help me feed my kids each month, right? Uh, if you want to help get them food as well, if you want to get your name in that graphic and whatnot, uh, click on the links in some of the description some of the description, click on some of the links in the description and find something that floats your boat. Or don't, you know? Your views and engagement help me regardless. If you're still watching me talk right now, you've probably already seen like four adverts across the length of the video. So as always, just leave me a comment for what type of history video you want to see next or what you thought of this one. And I'll see you when I look at your squad. You'll see me when you look at me. Thanks so much for watching.